Welcome back to Crit and Crit. It has been foreseen that I am sent. The ancient scrolls say that I am Axion. And we are continuing with our discussion of Brian Jake's Mossflower while we play through Undertale. As you might have guessed, we're talking about prophecies again, because we're in Redwall, which means we have lots and 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 lots of prophecies throughout this franchise. Not necessarily, Alphys. You don't have to kill Asgore to go home. There are plenty of others. I noticed you ran off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. So, Prophecy's actually fairly light for a lot of this one, whereas opposed to its other ones where we've seen, you usually start off with like, oh yes, we found this ancient piece of writing that just happens to be useful for this, or... We had a vision from Martin the Warrior that told us to go off on this quest. This time we don't really see anything until we're actually looking for Salamandastron. Admittedly, it's hard for Martin to be running around giving random prophecies to people when he's still alive. I mean, there were historically many figures who made their livings as oracles giving prophecies, so I mean, come on. Yeah, but Martin's not that kind of guy. Which we already talked about. He's very sad. But, but, yeah, so, we get the directions to Salamandastron, which kind of read like the usual riddles that you have to solve, but it's uh, written down as directions given to them from a bird. So it's kind of just a very, very poetic description of, here's how the ground looks from above, and this yep. is the route you need to Basically, take. Basically, oh, it's your house. But yeah, it's basically uh, it's basically describing a map. Yep. So, as Martin puts it, it's a strange route to follow, given in goose song, written in ancient badger, and translated into common woodland. So, there's dealing with like Google Translate problems too. But more relevant to this is just everything regarding Salamandastron. Besides the directions to get there. It seems almost like a foretelling, just a, fore and a foregone conclusion that Badger Warriors will seek out Salamandastron when the time comes. Yep, and as Bella Except specifies, that's male Badger Warriors. It Except for her husband, who uh, just died in other means. Say, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't one of the ones that uh, felt the calling. So he did not head off, but apparently their son did. Uh, Sunflash, I think they said his name was? Yep, Sunflash the Mace, who comes up later. Isn't he actually in uh, Mariel? Yes. It's either him or his son. I can't remember which. No, it is him. He shows up in like the last scene. Is like, oh, this is going down. We now have Sunflash uh, taking over for Boar because Boar no, is I meant, dead. Yeah, I know he shows up at the end of this. I'm, I was meaning in Mariel. I couldn't remember if it was him and Mariel or his son. I'm looking to check. Uh, okay, he appears in Mossflower and Outcast of Redwall. Okay, that's another one that we apparently missed when we're going backwards through, through chronology. Granted, I don't really like that one. Yeah, that one has issues. A lot of these have issues. Issues that even as a kid were hard to ignore. Yeah. Like, a lot of these have issues, but they're things that, like, at least for me, I didn't 
see a problem with when I was a kid because I didn't know better. Okay, yeah, it's it is, it's Ron Blade and Mariel Sunglasses Son. Okay. I had Let's to say the name didn't sound quite right, and it's been a while since we read Mariel, but yeah. That's why I asked. I wasn't sure, and then I went to check the Wordwall Wiki. But yeah, um. Apparently, it's only those who hear the call that become the Badger Warriors that head off to Salamanistron, and apparently, that's only the men. But that's not how it is later, because remember, there's what's her name, Mara, and in, in, actually in the book Salamanistron. We'll have to do that one later. Yep. That's. So I do. Want I'm to not getting. Yeah. 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 Let's not argue about this right now, because we're. Yeah, it, I was just. I was just pointing out that's how it's displayed in this book. Yes, it does apparently change later. Though it R retcon Abby, <laughs> yeah, but like even when Boar is, uh, he's naming the uh, the various uh, badgers on on the the prophecy carvings, and he does name one. Uh, I think it's Spear Lady something. I don't remember her name. I'll put it in. in Gorth. Gorth. Okay. Uh, so apparently. There were exceptions in the past, too. So, anyway, we've gotten sidetracked. <laughs> Look, Badger lore is serious business. It is serious business in world. But that does bring us to the subject of this particular conversation. The walls of Salamandastron in certain specific places are carved with ancient... Uh, ancient graphics depicting the future lords of the mountain throughout the years to come, as well as others who are relevant to the to Salamandastron's future history. Uh, and some other great deeds. Yeah. It, it specifically mentions that uh, there's all these badgers on there, but there's also the many hares who serve the uh who served the Lord of Salamandastron, and there's Morton and his companions, uh, Gonf, Dinny, and uh, Logalog, the shrew. Yeah. And, but uh, Bor is very careful to say, uh, for one thing, this is for our eyes alone, Martin, to, we two warriors. So he comes in and he shows him, and everything, here we go. Here's my father, Lord Brocktree, who we're absolutely going to talk about someday, because apparently we're going to keep reading about the uh, Dungeons and Dragons mice forever. <laughs> and then, they're good likenesses of you, I think, Boar whispered. So, yeah. Friend, believe me, I did not carve these pictures here, nor did my father. How long they have been here, I do not know. I accept it as part of the legend of Salamandastron. You must, too. You are the largest figure, and here are your friends. See, here you are leading them toward the mountain, here is Salamandastron, and here you are again emerging from it with your friends. You no longer carry the broken sword about your neck, you are holding a bright new sword. As for the rest, well, your guess is as good as mine. Which honestly makes me wonder if Boar would have just told them to leave if they hadn't been carved on the wall. Well, like you said, uh, because they were carved on the wall, he knew they were coming. So he sent his hares to, to fetch them, basically. And the three hares that are the first ones we meet are like, yeah, we're here to escort you to Salamandastron on behalf of Boar. Yeah, so they'd originally been planning to climb the mountain because they didn't know that there was an underground cavern to get into. But I wonder, because like, eventually he would have probably noticed and come outside because, well, you're clearly not vermin. And again, we're on D&D &D rules here, so the evil vermin are always chaotic evil. Okay, sorry, maybe lawful sometimes. I'm sorry. Except for Gingerbeer and his eventual partner. Yeah, well... Yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, I'm just like, so... I'm having some furry confusion right now in terms of like, oh, they're all animals, so they're all the same size, but are they wild cats, or are they house cats? Like, are they, are they just like wild house cats? Because like, they're clearly like on the same... Like, there's different sizes to the different creatures. Like, the badgers are clearly the biggest ones. I, I'm sorry. The way they're described the few times they're in the same scene, uh, 
like Bella and Sarmina are described as being of semi-equitable size, but I think Bella is described as being larger. Okay, so that would suggest like the size of a house cat. Which is fine, because, like, right here, like, they're able to, like, Martin goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sarmina, and there's not really an issue with it. But then you skip ahead to Redwall, where you have Matthias land in the mouth of a cat, uh, Squire Julian Gingivere, who is almost certainly, if not, like, I'm, it, he has to be a descendant of Gingivere. Oh, yeah. Come on. So, I'm guessing it's just, like, first edition wonkiness, because there's no way... Matthias would have been able to land inside the mouth of one of them if they're the same size in terms of like person size, person size. We go, to, we go dual now. Okay, I, I got distracted. Sorry, <laughs> it's, it's okay, me. it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, and that that does brave stranger questions because Sarmina is described as being larger than uh, Fortunata, who's a fox. Maybe she's a Maine Coon. I don't know. But yeah, um, I think this anyway. is reaching the point where where Jacques has, uh, where Jake's has kind of standardized most things being more or less the, in the same range of sizes with badgers on the high end and something like voles on the low. Maybe. Anyway, what I was trying to get at was would, like, Bor would have eventually realized they were there, and they would have come. We're coming to say like we're here because your daughter Bella needs help. Would he have turned them away because the prophecy didn't say his daughter would ask for help one day? Because she seems absolutely certain that he will help them. And when so is she just putting too much faith in him? Well, it's hard to say because when they arrive, he's like, "Yes, I know why you're here," and. Yeah, just don't worry about it. And he clearly has no interest in going back with them, even before the point where he's like, yeah, I know I'm going to die in the... Well, he's, he's already would have known that because, like, Martin's getting this information as new things, but like, are you all right, Boar? What's written there? Silence! Only Boar the Fighter must know that! He yells in the room of a thousand echoes that you're not supposed to speak above a whisper in, and Martin passes out from the noise. Yep. But you can tell from the fact that he's basically looking like, Oh god, my dog's been run over. Yeah, it's bad news, and he does indeed die in the fight with the pirates. So, basically, he. So what we know is that he left for Salamandastron many years ago. I don't remember if Bella said she was just a young child when he left, or if she was an adult at that point. I don't remember. But he knows he has a daughter who has a son that she ha can't find. Um, I'm trying to see what it says because it doesn't. I don't think it actually says. A lot of the prophecy is written as if it was done when she was a child. So all the clues, like the clues, are like. Look at the roof of your little fortress, which was the bottom of her father's table. And things like that. Yeah, so we also, we also know that she did lose her mother when she was a child. So if he also left while she was a child, he essentially orphaned his daughter because the prophecy said to do it. More or less... The prophecy says I don't have to pay child support. Ugh. And, yeah, it's... It's kind of just a given that... That's not ominous at all. It's kind of just a given that whatever is on the prophecy board is going to be how things are, and there's no arguing that. But no. he left before he ever saw that. And it's just 
like something he already knew was going to happen. He felt the calling and went to Salamandistron. And when he got there, he's like, well, here's the prophecy board. It knew I was going to come. This is just how things are. Yep. And, well, Martin has figured out pretty quick that, oh, you saw a prophecy of your own death. Uh, yeah, we're going to fight with you. I don't care what the prophecy says. It doesn't save him. But, yeah, I don't know. Like, I never know how to react to prophecy in fantasy fiction because, well... I don't like the willingness people have to put their own agency aside for the convenience of we found this poem from like 300 years ago and it's like super convenient right now because everything else they tell us in our society is take responsibility for yourself take responsibility for your own actions you need to be held accountable for the things you do prophecy oh yeah it's faded so I don't have to do any of that it's foretold no Screw that. The prophecy knows where you live. Yeah, well, the prophecy can help pay rent, then. If the prophecy's going to insist on running my life, the prophecy can actually chip in. Because I'm trying to get by without hearing the quote-unquote wisdom of the ages. From what I've seen in history, relying on prophecy tends to uh, be very hit or miss because so many of the ones that we've seen are, you know, vaguely worded. If you attack today, a great empire will fall. Like, those are just gotchas. Like, they're written deliberately to, uh... to be able to be misinterpreted. And who's to say that the prophecies in Redwall are not the same? We see how they happen, but conveniently, we don't see the wording or anything of this one. So the reader is left to believe that, yeah, this had to happen this way, but we don't actually know. We don't get to see it. I will say that there is a moment either... Jake's really worded this badly, or there is a moment where it implies that Salomon, Salamandistron itself is writing these prophecies as it goes. Because Bor is pointing out all of the predecessors carved into the walls, and then when he gets to himself, he says, there are spaces here for the Badger Lords who will come after me. But when we get to later uh, visits to Salamandistron, those later lords now have their own images carved in. But all of them claim, I didn't put this here. Neither you know, did my were, father. But you know who else is there that we could speculate is doing this? The hares. Yeah. That's a theory. But and uh, it's good, it could be really nitpicky though, and we might—I don't really want to start splitting hairs right now. Boo. But yeah, the hairs could be doing oh, it. I mean, Salamandistron is not just the Badger Lord. And I would, I would consider that an option if Boar hadn't just said only the Badger Lord and those he specifically brings into this chamber can see this. So that, that implies the hairs shouldn't be in there. Yeah, the, they could be unknowingly. Uh, breaking that rule and going in there uh, without him to, uh, or when when there is no lord and they're updating things. Uh, Possibly. This is also one of the earlier installments in the franchise, which also would, would fit in with there being a more supernatural yeah, that's, element that's, than, than is common in later series. That's later, kind, later of what I was, series. kind of what I was getting to, was to see yeah. if, maybe this was something that Jakes was planning in the... Uh, original writing of the story when there was a little bit more stuff that leaned a little towards magic. And uh, so he was like, no, Solomon Strand is carving its own history in doing the prophecy as it goes so that each Badger Lord doesn't know too much about what comes in the future but their own fate is... They do see their own fate written out before they got there. But, uh... That's just a... That's just a 
guess and a deduction based on what little we know uh, of the series in world of the of the situation in world rather, and of how the series uh, went as Jake's made it. I think that about wraps up everything I had to say on this subject, though. You? I have for- I have foreseen no further topics on this video. Then I believe the time has come for, as the statements have read, for this particular episode to come to a close. <laughs> Next time we'll continue our discussion of Mossflower and face off against Asgore. See y'all so then. So it is written. So it must be. No! No, it doesn't have to be! I mean, it does if I want to finish the game. Okay, fine. See y'all next time.